APP, and I want to welcome everyone. Tonight we have um, our lecturer is uh, Mr. Donnelly, Pat Donnelly, um, and he's the program director um, of the U.S. Military Chinook Program at Boeing. Uh, he's responsible for the day-to-day -day execution of all development, manufacturing, and delivery aspects of these aircraft. Pat joined the Boeing Company in 1980 um, in the design group and served in a variety of roles in engineering and support. Pat holds a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, a master's in mechanical engineering from Cornell, and a master's in business administration from Widener University. He's also completed the advanced program management course from the Defense Acquisition University at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Pat's been active with the Vertical Flight Society and is on the board for the Delaware Valley chapter of the Army Aviation Association of America. So Pat, I'd like to turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Judy. Welcome. Can everyone hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so Eric Coca, one of your uh, members, uh, is a longtime pilot here at Philadelphia. And um, I presented something similar to this uh, recently and and he thought it'd be good for me to share this with, uh, with your organization. So um, this started as a history of Boeing in the Philadelphia area. And it kind of got more interest to me and in not only just Boeing, but of the, really of the land uh, defined as uh, Delaware River to Route 95 and Darby, uh, excuse me, Darby Creek to Crumb Creek. And it's, um, hopefully you'll you're, be entertained by, uh, by what I'd like to share. Um, I would like to thank a couple of people who provided me a lot of the pictures that I'll be showing tonight, and obviously Wikipedia, uh, that was a lot of source of, of my information. Um, so I'll just start out a little bit with Boeing. Uh, Boeing, as everyone knows, uh, is very familiar with airplanes, but we also build helicopters, and we build helicopters here in Ridley Park, Pennsylvania, uh, as well as out in Mesa, Arizona, which is just outside of Phoenix. Um, both sites are about uh, the same size. Uh, we have about the same amount of employees. Uh, Philadelphia has 4,500 employees here. Uh, in Mesa, we build the Apache and the Little Bird for the U.S. military. And then in Philadelphia, we build the Chinook and the B-22, also for the U.S. military. But enough about Boeing. Let's talk about the area. And oh, by the way, Rick did ask me to make sure that I shared information and how it related to, to Philadelphia. So I do have some of that in here first. So um, I was able to trace back this area all the way back to the Swedish colonies um, that kind of started settling in Delaware and Delaware County in 1638. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a picture of a house called the Hendrickson House that was originally built um, by Hendrick Johnson and gave it to his son as a wedding present uh, to Andrew Harrickson and his wife. Uh, this house uh, still exists today, and I'll share a little bit more about that in a moment, um, but it also apparently served as a rowdy tavern during the, during the uh, US Revolutionary War. Now also, when people think of witchcraft, of course, everyone thinks of Salem Massachusetts, but also living in this, this area and this land um, was a, a woman by the name of Margaret Matson, And um, she, along with uh, Yashiro Hendrickson, were accused of witchcraft. Um, this, this happened in, uh, 19, in 1683. Um, Margaret Matson was known as the Witch of Ridley Creek. And it was it turns out to be the only uh, trial ever held in the province of Pennsylvania. Uh, she was tried in front of William Penn himself, as, along with many jurists. Uh, and this is on December 7th of 1683. Um, they resolved the matter the same day. And the verdict was that she was guilty of having the common fame of a witch but was found not guilty in a manner and form of which she stand indicted. So tried as a witch, but uh, decided that she really wasn't a witch. 
unlike the Salem, Massachusetts activities. Now, what does this area have in connection with Philadelphia? Uh, there's a statue in the North Plaza at City Hall at Broad and Market Street of a man by the name of Matthias Baldwin. Uh, he lived from 1795 to 1866. Now, originally he was born in Elizabethtown, New Jersey, but at his father's death, um, his family went bankrupt. It turned out the executor of the will took all the money. So at 16, he found himself having to be an indentured apprentice in Philadelphia, working for a skilled jeweler, uh, actually in Frankfurt. Um, and at the age of 24, he developed a method for gold plating that became the industry standard. So a young age, uh, a brilliant man, an uh, engineer. A matter of fact, the statue has him holding um, a drawing compass in his hand. So um, he has been attributed to founding the Franklin Institute in 1824. Uh, he was also a very much an abolitionist and he donated money in 1835 to creating an African-American school for children where actually he paid the salaries out of his own pocket. Um, being an, an outspoken abolitionist, uh, that his competitors used that against him and tried to, to compete for his business. But what was his business? So, as I said, he was a jeweler um, and a whitesmith, and uh, he teamed up with a David Mason, who was a machinist, and they decided to build product, basically bookbinders tools and cylinders for calico printing. Um, which is a raised printing process. And during that, time, during that activity, he ended up building his own engine, uh, his own end steam engine to, to support production. And he built a small locomotive for uh, exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum. So he was approached by the Germantown and Norristown Railroad to build a train. Now, having only built a, uh, a production engine for, for his support, and building a small locomotive for toy uh, for an exhibition, he went to the Camden and Amboy Railroad and inspected their engines. And without more modern tools, he built uh, the first engine by hand uh, and was christened Old Ironsides in November 23, 1832. Uh, by the way, this train was active for over 20 years. Now, um, Baldwin started with uh, and in that time frame, and in 1837, he had built 40 locomotives. And yet, what you'll hear time and time again with this locomotive industry was very cyclical. And in 1840, he only had nine locomotives uh, built that year, very heavy debt. Um, and yet, he continued. In 1857, he built 66 locomotives, and he also started uh, uh, peace pay work for his workers. So the more they built, uh, the more money they made. And, he, and he, at that point in time, he employed about 600 people. Now, um, in 1836, uh, his company was really the top name um, for trains or for locomotives in the, in the industry. And he was building about 40 locomotives annually in, in 1836. Um, the gentleman died, as I said, um, later on, but his company prevailed. And by 1906, they were producing uh, 2,500 locomotives with 17,000 employees. And they, they, uh, they had this facility in, in Philadelphia, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but he also started, uh, he needed more space. So he started building shops down in Eddystone, which is again, where the Boeing uh, is currently located. So he had 196 acres of, in, of factory uh, in Broad Street. So as you can see here, between 18th and Broad, between Spring Garden um, and the subway station, he uh, occupied a very large factory. Um, so by 1907, which is 41 years after the founder's death, they were employing 18,500 people, 39 buildings, and they were averaging about 2,000 um, steam locomotives a year, which was two and a half times more product than their nearest competitor. 
Um, they're trained for known as workhorses. Um, the trains are on Pikes Peak. The trains were on Trans-Siberian Express. Uh, very successful. Now, um, given that, um, the European, the, the VP for uh, Baldwin uh, was a name by the name of San Vauclain and uh, very successful in acquiring orders from Europe. Uh, and as a matter of fact, part of the, the success at that time in the 1914-1950 timeframe was because World War I and most of the factories in Europe were being recommissioned to build armament. So um, Baldwin's VP, the Sam Buckley, went to Europe, uh, got orders for UK, got orders from France, Ireland, uh, and even Imperial Russia. And so he came back and started building uh, activities and um, France and the UK uh, started asking if they could build uh, artillery shells. So Baldwin Company formed the Eddystone Ammunition Corporation in June of 1915 and got a contract to build two and a half million uh, artillery shells from Europe. Um, now, with that success, they formed another subsidiary, the Eddystone's Munitions Corporation, where they actually ended up building more than six and a half million shells for the United States government in that same war. Now, unfortunately, the Eddystone um, Munition Factory is also known for the Eddystone explosion that killed 139 people in April 10th of 1917. Mostly were women and children um, who were factory workers at the time, but um, they opened again two weeks later to support the, the war activity. Now, Baldwin Locomotives in 1912, um, again, very successful, and, um, but yet very unstable. So as I mentioned before, how the ups and downs. So they produced 2,666 locomotives in Philadelphia in 1906. They built 614 in 1908. Uh, they were forced to reduce their workforce from 18,500 down to 4,600 in 1907. But this Sam Vauclain character was still wanted to continue to push and expand so they decided to expand the plant in Eddystone uh, and then end up moving all of their production um, from, from the Philadelphia area uh, down to Eddystone in 1928. And they had built a huge factory, the largest factory uh, for locomotive in the world at the time. And unfortunately, Baldwin never was able to, uh, to exceed about 30% of that capacity. Now Baldwin, was known for building uh, steam locomotives. Uh, very successful, as I said, one of the largest producers of steam locomotives. They ended up producing over 70,000 uh, steam locomotives. Their problem was that they got too late to get into the diesel industry. They didn't start doing diesel engines until 1943. Uh, and at that point in time, uh, the demand for steam locomotives started to, to tail off. But uh, much like World War I, very strong competitor in World War II. They built not only trains and switches, but they also built tanks. They built the Sherman tank, the M3, at the Eddystone plant. And um, they were recognized as the, as among the U.S. corporations to be the, the 40th largest uh, as measured by wartime contracts. Um, largest producer of steam locomotives, as I said, uh, the Franklin Institute still has a large um, steam locomotive on display, and Walt Disney's Magic Kingdom still runs four of their engines uh, as they draw people uh, around uh, Disneyland or Disney World. They produced the last locomotive in 1954. It was number 70,541. Now, uh, what else is going on in this same land mass between Philadelphia and 95? Um, Baldwin created General Steel Castings Corporation in 1928 um, to build steel and steel castings for their trains. So the plant was in Delaware River was opened in 1930 and they had, they formed castings that weighed somewhere between 100 pounds and their largest was 110,000 pounds. 
Uh, eventually, uh, General Steel Castings, their headquarters moved to Granite City, Illinois in 1948, and they closed this particular plant uh, and sold it to Boeing in 1964. But um, what I'd like to point out, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this building in the foreground uh, still exists today and is actually the plant that Boeing occupies and builds helicopters for. So looking inside just to several of the pictures, uh, this is in 1929, what they call the East Boundary Bay. Um, this is what it looked like in May of 1930. Um, and this is, it look, doesn't look a whole lot different if you drove by it today uh, in what we call the, the Boeing plant. Now, I talked about Baldwin, I talked about general castings, but there was all sorts of other things that seemed to happen on, I was kind of fascinated by the fact in this landmass. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a couple more of those things. Now, um, other industries, as you can see here, Remington Rifle, uh, Platte LaPage Aircraft, um, Piseki Aircraft Corporation, all in this area. And by the way, this is where Baldwin tested their tanks along the Delaware River. Uh, they had a huge um, dock system that they built so they could move things on and off, uh, down, up and down the Delaware River. But let's talk about a couple of those other, other elements. So Eddystone Rifle Plant, opened in 1915. Now, uh, what started off was that in, in, 30, in April 30th of 1915, the UK ordered one and a half million Enfield rifles from Remington Arms, which is located in New York. So Remington recognized that they couldn't build uh, all of that product in, in their factory, convinced Baldwin uh, to build a 14 acre plant. Baldwin, took advantage of that and decided that he was gonna build this plant, lease it back to Remington with the expectation is that should they need to, they could take back ownership of the plant and use it for his, uh, his train factory. So the Eddystone rifle plant was opened up on 31 December, 1915. At its peak, they employed 15,000 employees, 3,000 of them were women. So 20% of the workforce in the 1915 timeframe uh, were women, and they built 6,000 rifles a day. Um, and they end up building just shy of 2 million. Now, other, other things to note is that Remington called this plant the Remington Arms Company of Delaware. Oddly enough, I guess Delaware County, since it was in Pennsylvania. And another useless fact was uh, Colonel John Thompson uh, left the Army and became the chief engineer of the Remington Arms Company. And he is known from, build, from developing the Thompson submachine gun many years later. Now, Midvale Steel, Midvale Steel and Ordnance Company absorbed Remington Arms in 1918. This, by the way, was the largest arms factory in the world uh, in, that, in the time frame. But uh, Remington, excuse me, Midvale Steel and Ordnance absorbed Remington Arms and closed the factory. Now, Next door was a company called Platt LaPlage. So a gentleman by the name of Wynne LaPlage, who was a British engineer, partnered with Haviland Platt, and they decided to acquire the manufacturing rights of a German uh, airplane and build that in the United States. Unfortunately for them, the timing was off. And uh, as they were trying to make a deal with the Germans uh, in this time frame of 1915, uh, the relationship between the United States and Germany kind of ran afoul, and so they were unable to uh, acquire the manufacturing rights. So they developed their own airplane, uh, known as the PL-1, and the military version was the PL-3, and they won, later on, they won the competition to supply the Army with its first helicopter. And this is a picture of the first helicopter called the XR-1. And, you know, I'm always fascinated looking at old pictures of aviation looking at two gentlemen standing underneath the aircraft without a helmet, without any safety equipment, um, obviously fixing a landing gear uh, while the pilot hovered the aircraft. Now, while they won the competition uh, to build the first helicopter for the Army, uh, their first design, the XR-1, had problems with control, vibration, and resonance. Now, the Army, you know, stuck with them 
And so Platt Lepage developed the XR1A, but it turned out to be no better. And so although they had their first flight in 1943, it crashed in 1944 and the Army canceled the contract. Um, to kind of show the, how small the aviation world is, uh, McDonald Aircraft Company from St. Louis uh, bought this company uh, somewhere between 1942 and 1944. And one of their aircraft, the PL-9, ended up becoming the HXJD-1, which is the first twin engine helicopter uh, built in the United States. I point out McDonnell Douglas, well, McDonnell, because McDonnell Aircraft merged with McDonnell Douglas, and then Boeing and McDonnell Douglas merged back in 1997 and became the Boeing company. So I can't talk about helicopters, I can't talk about this area without mentioning Frank Paisecki. Uh, Frank Paisecki was a, a young engineer, graduate from UPenn, and he formed a consortium of, uh, or a group of other UPenn engineers, um, and they developed, they decided they were going to develop a helicopter. So they formed the company in 1940, um, and they developed what was known as the PB-2, which was the first single-seat helicopter uh, built and designed, and that's a picture of the, the PB-2 behind Frank and some of the other engineers uh, in that bottom picture. Frank flew the helicopter and was the first holder of a US helicopter license in the United States. He, his company that he formed was called PV Engineering uh, in 1943, and it was funded by Felix DuPont and Lawrence Rockefeller. Um, so Paisecki expanded and built the Paisecki Helicopter Company uh, in Springfield, Pennsylvania in 1947. Uh, that factory still, that factory building still exists. It's a BJ's on Route 420 uh, in Springfield. Now, Frank was a brilliant man. Uh, I, I was fortunate to know Frank in his later years, but he wasn't a very good um, businessman, shall we say. So Rockefeller forced Paisecki out as the board chairman in 1955. So he said, fine. He left, formed another company called Paisecki Aircraft Corporation in 1955. Um, and so Paisecki Helicopters was kind of forced to not to be confused with Paisecki Aircraft and renamed their company Vertol Aircraft Company also in 1956. Now Vertol stands for Vertical Takeoff or Landing. So it's another kind of broad term for, for helicopters. And they continued to refine some of their old designs. Uh, what you're looking at in the background in the picture here on the top picture is the first flight of the CH-47, which is now known as a CH-47 Chinook. That flew uh, in 1961, and the picture down below is a, uh, what is known as the Sea Knight, or the CH-46, which they built many, many of for the United States Marine and the Navy. Now, Boeing acquired Bertal on March 31st of 1960. So these are actually Boeing helicopters that flew um, as, the, as the Chinook, or as this particular case, the YC, YHC-1B uh, on April 28th. So, you know, interesting fact, we're still building Chinooks today. We have one of the longest continuous building of a factory of a production aircraft. Um, so first flight in 1961, so here we are, 2020. Uh, still building helicopters, and far as we can tell, we're going to be building Chinooks for, for many years to come. So going back, this is what the site looked like when Vertol bought the, the facility. They bought 291 acres from General Steel. So in the bottom there, that label D was where Baldwin locomotive was located. But General Steel factory still existed. Uh, there on the on the upper portion. Now to to put context to what where we are today, uh, here's Darby Creek. Uh, Crumb Creek actually is is along here. Uh, this is Stewart Avenue, the exit off of 95. If you want to come to visit the plant, um, this area was a lake um, that was actually formed from a, as a runoff from from Crumb Creek, and this sea. This building right here, this is actually the Hendrickson House. And when Boeing acquired the property and decided to, 
to build their factory here, they offered anyone um, the house for free if they would remove it from their property. So, Old Swedes Church in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, acquired the house. They moved it down to Wilmington, and so the house still stands today, and it's now a museum and a library uh, for Old Swedes Church, and the museum um, honors the, the history of the Swedish population uh, moving, uh, moving to the United States. It is the oldest Swedish American house in the United States, and oddly, it is the oldest house in Delaware, albeit having been built in Pennsylvania. Now, um, as I said, Boeing purchased uh, Bertal helicopters in 1960, uh, 1961. And uh, so they opened up a huge factory on our property uh, on September 27, 1966. Uh, big ceremony um, to point out a few people. So this is at the time that was Bob Farrington. He was the Boeing, Boeing airplane VP for Bertal. Sitting next to him is, is Bill Scranton, uh, who was the Pennsylvania governor at the time. Uh, the ne man next to him is Bill Allen, who was the president of Boeing out of Seattle. And sitting next to him is Major General McCutcheon, who was the deputy chief of staff of the Marine Corps. Uh, 13,000 people uh, came to the, to, the, to the ceremony. And so this is what the Boeing a helicopter company looked like, or Boeing Bertal at the time uh, looked like. As you can see, they kind of captured all of the general steel casting structure, gutted the inside, and built up uh, to support the factory. So by 1966, the company had grown from 1,800 employees to 12,000 employees, and we were building 30 helicopters a month, essentially one a day. So this is just a picture of the of inside the factory. Um, building the aircraft side by side. So these are Chinooks. And over there is a sea knight. Um, to give you, you ladies and gentlemen, a little bit of a perception. So the Chinook still built today holds about 33 uh, troops inside. Uh, the CH-46 uh, held about 24 troops inside. Uh, this this sea knight, uh, affectionately known as the frog by the Marines, uh, flew up until just a few years ago. It was actually replaced by the V-22. Its primary mission uh, before it was retired was vert rep, which is to actually move cargo from one ship to another. Uh, the V-22 is now the number one assault vehicle for the US Marine Corps. Um, it is a airplane that I'll, sh I'll show you in a little bit. But yeah, 30 of these vehicles were built a month, essentially one a day in the 1967-68 timeframe to support uh, the Vietnam War. Um, now, um, let's see, do I have things out of order? Yeah, well, I'll jump, I'll jump to trains for the, for the moment. So at the end of the Vietnam War, uh, the defense industrial base was worried of, of collapse. So the U.S. government funded the Urban Train Association uh, to build trains, and Boeing was fortunate to win several contracts to do that. So um, by May of 1973, we were producing Boeing trains, which actually a, con a consortium that we had teamed up with Kawasaki. So Kawasaki would build all the parts, ship them to the United States, and would build these trains in our factory. Same very, the same very factory that you, uh, you see here, uh, where we were building trains. Um, we built trains for Boston and San Francisco, and Boston operated their trains until 2007. Now I call them trains, but they were really light rail vehicles, which I would more likely refer to as trolley cars. Um, they also built elevated trains for Chicago, um, and, and they started delivering those trains in 1976. And Chicago actually operated these trains until 2014. So uh, besides the Chinook and the Sea Knight, uh, Boeing had a lot of experimentation with helicopters over the, the last many years. And so in no particular order, I'll kind of describe a few of them. First off, uh, this helicopter here, um, the red, white, and blue 
helicopter that with a New York um, Airways sign on it. Um, it was actually built in 1958 was his first flight. And it, so it actually predated the C night, but it is, it looks like a CH-46. So New York Airways was one of many companies that purchased these uh, helicopters. And the New York Airways used to use this uh, to transport people from the airports to the inner city of New York. Um, and it's always renowned for landing on top of the Pan Am building in New York City. Uh, another aircraft was this one. This was the Model 347. It was uh, a modified Chinook uh, with the expectation is that if they could add some additional lift and if they could increase the size, um, they could carry more troops, marry more more, more um, ammunition, more cargo. So they added a fourth rotor blade to the front and back rotor, added this wing, and added a midsection body. And it was a partnership between the Army and Boeing. Unfortunately, um, although it flew in 1969, uh, it was deemed too expensive. And so the program never went forward. Another activity that Boeing pursued was this one down here called the heavy lift helicopter or the uh, HC-862. This was contracted by Boeing and Na by NASA and the Army um, to compete with a Russian helicopter. You know, heaven forbid at that time, the Russians built a helicopter larger than what the United States could build. So we built the fuselage. It was uh, really ahead of its time. It was a composite fuselage. It was a fly-by-wire flight control system. Unfortunately for Boeing, we were unable to, never able to get the transmissions to hold together. Um, there was so much torque going through that, that transmissions that they, they tended to fail. So we never flew the aircraft. And when I started back in 1980, this was actually parked um, on our land behind the, behind the flight test hangars and it was eventually uh, scrapped. Another aircraft uh, pursuit was the Model 234. Uh, this one was uh, pursued in the early 80s as a commercial variant to the Chinook. Kind of uh, taken on for what New York Airways did, the expectation was, is that we could use this to transport large, large amount of people uh, into areas that cannot be reached by airplane. So one of the biggest um, offerings was British Airways bought um, eight of these aircraft and they were flying them from uh, England onto the North Shore oil rigs. And one of the advantages there is that because it was such a large helicopter, they could replace the whole crew all at one time. Whereas before, they would have to do multiple helicopter trips. Um, Boeing built 13 of these, not only for British Airways, but actually Trump. Trump Casino bought one, and he used that to transport gamblers from New York City down to his casino in Atlantic City. Um, as I said, 13 were built, eight, eight still exist, and they've been all bought by Columbia Helicopters out in Portland, Oregon, and they use them for logging and other um, commercial uh, goods transport. Now, another helicopter of, that was built here was the Model 360. When the CH-46, when the Marines talked about retiring it, Boeing built this on spec. Um, it was an all composite uh, helicopter. It too had four blades on front and back. And it almost set the world speed record for helicopter at the time. It flew 213 knots. The record was 214 knots. <coughs> but unfortunately, we had some, some issues with some of the parts. Um, the Marines decided they didn't want to buy this helicopter and Boeing decided we spent enough money, uh, so we retired it. This helicopter actually does exist still it's up at the Helicopter Museum up in Westchester. And finally, uh, this is a venture that, that Boeing and Sikorsky teamed together with to build the next generation attack helicopter for the US Army. Um, we formed the Alliance back in 1985. We won the competition uh, to build the attack helicopter for the Army um, in the 1990 timeframe. We first flew in 1996, and it was a stealth helicopter, so it had a reduced radar signature, reduced IR signature, reduced acoustic signature. Unfortunately, it took so long to develop 
primarily driven by the fact that the army wasn't spending enough money to, to do it all in a timely manner, that the program ended up being canceled in, in 2004. So this is what the Boeing site looks like today. Um, recognizing there's the, the General Steel Castings building uh, still exists. And if you're not familiar with Boeing uh, here on off 95, and uh, oh, by the way, here is 95 as it goes up towards Philadelphia. This is Route 291 that splits our factory in half. We build the H-47 here, we assemble it, and we fly it. So when we take delivery, the aircraft actually flies uh, off our flight ramp um, down to wherever the Army is uh, deploying their aircraft, whatever military base. Um, the Army operates 472 Chinooks. The Special Forces operates in another 69 aircraft. And we estimate there's about 900 aircraft flying over around the world because we have 19 countries that have bought the Chinook. Now, here, this picture shows that this was where the V-22 factory was located. Uh, the V-22, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute, is a joint venture between Boeing and Bell. So we team with Sikorsky helicopters to build the Comanche. We team with the Bell helicopters uh, to build the V-22. We built the fuselage, and we've since moved the factory from here to here, to the other corner of the, the campus because now the Marines are flying the V-22s that they originally purchased back to Boeing for, for overhaul and upgrade. So now you should be able to see V-22s and Chinooks flying up and down the river uh, for the foreseeable future. We also build parts for F-18 uh, fighters out in St. Louis. We have the, one of the largest wind tunnels in the free world, certainly the largest wind tunnel uh, east of the Mississippi. Um, and we actually have had race car drivers in there with their, their designs. We actually had the New York Giants in there once throwing footballs across the wind so they can, they can calculate what it would take to, to throw a football. Um, if you do drive up and down 291, you will also see a world power, which is where we track and balance our rotor blades. And I mentioned Paiseki before. When Paiseki was bought out by, by Rockefeller and kind of kicked out, he created his own company, Paiseki Aircraft Company, and this is where they're located, uh, just across Darby Creek uh, from the Boeing plant. And they still exist today, and they still build helicopters today. So, you know, where's the future of Boeing? So here's a picture of that B-20, B-22. It takes off like an airplane. These rotors rotate up. Um, so it takes off like a helicopter, converts while in flight to an airplane. It can go about 250 knots. Uh, and it is the number one assault platform for the United States Marines. Uh, Japan have bought 14 of them. Uh, the Navy just signed a contract to build 50 of them. They're gonna replace their um, cargo uh, airplanes that land on an, air, on an aircraft carrier. Uh, and so they're gonna use these things because they're certainly much more versatile and they can actually take them off the aircraft carrier and they can operate off of a ship in the battle group, but not take up the valuable space uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of an airplane, which is always critical on an aircraft carrier. This is a picture of the Apache, uh, the Army's number one uh, attack platform. 16 other countries fly this aircraft. Here's a Chinook. Um, we are now in the process of flying the next version of the Chinook. It's called the Block 3. Next version, I mean, we've been building Chinooks, as I said, since 1961. Uh, the current model, which is, this is a picture of, is the F model, uh, but we're building now the Block 3. We're testing that in Mesa, Arizona, out in Boulder, Colorado, and down in um, Huntsville, Alabama. And we're hoping uh, that the Army will sign, will award a contract with us next year to replace the 472 Chinooks that they currently operate uh, with this Block 3. It actually can carry 4,000 more pounds than the current helicopter, uh, and it is designed to to fly faster. Here's a picture of the Little Bird, which is also built in Mesa, Arizona, and Phoenix, Arizona. So these two vehicles here uh, are built uh, in Arizona. Now, I talked about the Boeing Sikorsky Comanche, the Boeing Bell V-22. Well, here's a Boeing Sikorsky uh, aircraft. 
uh, that we're building together and is now flying down in West Palm Beach, Florida at the Sikorsky Flight Test Center. It achieved 200 knots yesterday, so it's still in development. Um, and it is competing against a tilt rotor variant that Bell is building on their own uh, to replace the aircraft called the Black Hawk that the US Army flies, as well as the Air Force uh, flies. Um, the Army flies 2,000 of these aircraft, so Boeing and Sikorsky are looking for a very lucrative contract should we win. It's a unique design. It has rotors that counter-rotate. One rotates one way, one rotates the other way with a very large propeller in the back. Now the propeller is designed so we could actually go backwards so the aircraft can back up uh, or actually can use as, a, as essentially a drag chute. So this aircraft is designed to go 250 knots, about the same speed as a tilt rotor. And uh, it can accelerate with the help of this fan and it can decelerate with the help of that fan. Uh, and it can hover uh, like a conventional helicopter. So team with Bell Air, teamed with, uh, with Sikorsky here. And oh, we haven't done nut teaming. So here we've teamed with Leonardo Helicopters. Leonardo Helicopters, his main headquarters is in um, Italy. However, there is a plant in North Philadelphia uh, that builds helicopters. They build this uh, 139, which is a commercial helicopter that uh, companies such as Oil Rigs uh, operate. But we've teamed with them and we recently won a contract to build 90 helicopters for the United States Air Force. We're calling it the MH-139, while Leonardo in Northern Philadelphia will build most of it. It'll then fly down across Philadelphia, uh, landing here at our place. Uh, we will add some military components that are kind of restricted that Leonardo up in North Philly can't handle. And then we'll deliver this helicopter also out of this plant. So, any given day, you should be able to see a Chinook, a B-22, or an MH-139 uh, operating in and around this facility. 